just an outline of what I'll be looking at. Um, any talk, I suppose, you need to start with the history. Then, what's it all about? Why do people do astrophotography? And I've got it down to the hunt, and then the challenge, and the different genres that we, that we operate in. I'll be looking a bit at LRGB photography, narrowband, and then what do you need to get, to get started in, in, in this hobby? Um, and a bit of my journey, and I'll show you some of the images and some of the challenges producing those, those images. But before we actually start, a very important warning. Very dangerous, can be very dangerous to your health. That's actually me um, after an all-night session. But a few years ago, you can see I still had hair, just when I started, started this. Uh, and there's, be careful, otherwise it's bye-bye money. And if you're not careful, bye-bye wife. And ultimately, bye-bye your sanity as well. Right, now for the bad news. No, there's no bad news. Um, fortunately, I'm still standing here. Um, and maybe it's standing here today shows that I'm not next door in, in Fartenberg uh, Mental Hospital, so I've still got my sanity. Um, maybe somebody up there is telling me something being so close, uh, I've got to watch it. Um, this morning we, I'm staying at the Courtyard Hotel and I opened the curtains and I saw this massive wire fence barrier, it's more like a, like a torpedo barrier and there was a, a Shade net, I don't know what the shade netting is for, with electric fence and another electric fence, and I assumed Falkenberg is on the other side. And I realized, okay, I'm okay, it's not so easy to get into. <laughs> right. A bit of the history. Uh, Forty years ago, it was really the domain of the professionals. Um, equipment was just too expensive and too complicated for the amateur. And then the first breakthrough came in around 1970 when telescopes with the first C8 eight inch um, became affordable and you could start really doing some, some serious astrophotography. That was the start of mass production. The next breakthrough, I believe, came with uh, the go-to telescope was around about 1992. That made it very easy for the, for the novice and, 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 and the amateur to start off with. And then finally in the late 1990s, the CCD camera came about, made it easier to control from your computer. And from that, the whole software industry around photography and astrophotography really came, came to the fore. Right, when I was asked to do this talk, I thought, okay, why do we do this? What, 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 what draws people to this? To this? And I thought, you know, it's really because it, it appeals to, to human nature. First of all, there's a hunt. First you've got to find a target. Then you've got to shoot the target. And maybe because of this hunter instinct, um, if, you look, if you look on the World Wide Web, it's mainly men involved in this hobby. Very few ladies, very few ladies. <coughs> maybe it's because of this hunting uh, instinct. Um, but there's a lot of gathering as well, so I'm sure you know, data gathering, women, women really should also become involved. It's a gamble. You can spend hours taking something which you think is going to look okay, but maybe you can't even use it, maybe it's just a mediocre target that you're imaging, maybe it's okay, and maybe it's excellent. So it's a bit of a gamble, so that appeals to that side of human nature. It's a challenge, particularly initially, You've got to learn all these things. You've got to get over all these hurdles. And once you've gone through all these hurdles, as you get more proficient, you lift the hurdles a bit. So it's a challenge. You're challenging yourself all the time. Okay, Because you are imaging something that you can't really see, it's not natural what you're doing, um, you can bring out the artistry in you as well. Making that thing look nice, presentable, and your perception of what you think that target should actually look like. 
the end of the day, there's a satis your satisfaction if you've done a good job and uh, it looks nice. And then ultimately, if you want recognition, today there's easy ways you can publish it in journals, you can publish on the World Wide Web quite easily. If you've done a good image, you can email it to your family and friends. And if you've done a bad one, you can email it to your enemies and jam up their inboxes if you want to. <laughs> right, now let's, I'm going to take out some of these yes, aspects with Lee the Hunt. Obviously first you've got to decide what are you going to target. You can get that from books. There are a lot of good books out there. In the southern hemisphere not so much. The internet. A lot of information on the internet. Then there are software tools. Um, here's one. Oh, it's very small. But basically, you select your. We you stand on the side that I can see. You select your your your, your position, your telescopes, and, uh, your, your camera that you're using, your filters that you're using, and it'll give you a list of possible targets giving you the, the deck and the, and the rise set times, etc. And the image size, you have an idea. So that can generate and get lists like that and you can decide on what, what, kind of a, what kind of a target it is. But that will only give you a rough idea. Very important is to have a planetarium application. There are many of them out there. There are some free ones as well that are pretty good. And with that you can select your target once you know what you want, uh, set it up so that you can actually see what your target's going to look like in your camera's field of view. Um, is it too small? Is it going to work? Is it too big? Um, you would also set your, your guide camera up as well, offset of your guide camera, to make sure that you're getting a guide, a good guide star as well. And if you're using a, a gem, you must obviously do the same on the other side for your meridian flip. And you'd move, you can see I've moved that down, it's not in the center of the image, so that I make sure I've got stars on both sides. Right, now we're going to do the actual target acquisition. We found the target. Um, there's a little free app that you can get, for instance, where you click on, you add the target from the field of view into this little application. You can select your imaging times, your filters, and that will produce a little text file like that, which you then can use. You can see it's a C++ format. You can write software then to do your imaging for you, or you can pull that into some commercial software that will do that for you. Right. We've done the hunt. Now the challenge. The challenge to me is because there's so many different disciplines involved in this. First of all, there's astronomy. Now what I know about astronomy is actually seriously dangerous. I did a bit of uh, physics, uh, physics 101 for engineers at, at uh, university, and this is about as close as I got to formal training. But obviously you've got to know the basics, um, and that you learn with time. Optics, you got to know about the focal lengths of your camera, or your, your, your system, and the optics and how it works. Mechanics, um, You've got to be a bit of a handyman because you build this as you go along, you build it up, you've got to make, you've got to do building work, you've got to do mechanical work. You need to be a bit of a handyman as well. Obviously you need to know, have a good, good knowledge about computers and how to write software if you want to do that. You don't have to, you can write your own software but you can actually get various free software as well and you can buy software. And then you need to understand the various software packages that you're using to do your work. You need to know quite a bit about uh, camera electronics because obviously your biggest enemy is noise. You need to know how to get your signal noise ratio up as high as you can. So you need to understand that, how to calibrate your, your, your uh, images, etc. Uh, we went through this yesterday at the, at the, the workshop. You need to understand um, how to get rid of your bad, bad pixels, calibration, data detection, etc. How to combine your images. And that was all part of the workshop yesterday. And finally, once you've done your data collection, um, you, get, you get to the pretty picture part where you can let your artistic 
uh, juices flow and you develop your, your image. The various genres, there's the purely scientific, the double star work. Now I haven't done any of that, so that is a future challenge for me. Another thing I haven't attempted yet, planetary and lunar work. Um, that you need obviously a high powered uh, scope, but fortunately you can do that with a video camera, so the camera is quite cheap. And you get uh, color cameras or you can get motor, motor cameras as well, which you use with filters. And then deep sky. You can go wide or you can go narrow. So for the wide fields would be your nebula, your clusters and narrow fields, the smaller nebula clusters and galaxies. You can go color and color you can have a cooled color <coughs> camera or an un uncooled camera. A DSLR for instance you can start off with quite easily as well. Or you can go then the monochrome which is also cooled and uncooled. And un if you're doing monochrome you can do LRGB which I'll get to now or narrow band. Now, if we look at the LRGB photography, what you basically do, where this is now different to, if you're using a, a mono one shot, sorry, a one shot color camera, you don't worry about all this. You, you take one picture of the visible uh, spectrum, um, and your typical D, DSLR cameras also cut out the infrared uh, as well. If you're doing LRGB work, you would do a luminance image, so you take the visible spectrum through a luminance filter, which cuts out the UV and the NIR as well. Or you can use what they call a clear um, uh, filter, which has got that yellow spectrum line there, picks up the NIR as well if you want to do that. Uh, it does tend to fill up your, your, your pixels quite quickly, so most guys use a um, luminance filter not to have the new infrared stuff as well. And then you'd use your color filters, blue, green, red, but your information really is in your luminance, so you don't have to do as many uh, with the color filters, and you normally bin your color filters 2x2 or 4x4 four four, uh, to make them faster. You don't need to spend so much time doing that part of it. Now the problem obviously with, with um, visible spectrum work is that You've got to have a dark side to really do good work. Um, obviously you can't do it when the moon's out, or the moon's close to your target, and light pollution is, is a big problem. That's why the tendency now is to go to narrow band imaging. Now here's the, the visible spectrum once again, from blue through to uh, infrared. Um, the typical filters that we use is oxygen, O3, hydrogen alpha, sulfur. Um, there's also nitrogen which I think sits just next to hydrogen alpha as well. And then obviously you, you do get the infrared filters that you could use uh, as well. Um, the problem obviously is that um, using these filters you, you really get a false image because there's absolutely nothing in the green part of the spectrum that you are actually using. The advantage is depending on the bandwidths of these filters that you can not worry about too much about your your sky glow. You can even, if you've got narrow enough filters, you can actually do um, do your imaging under full, full moon conditions. Obviously not close to the moon, but the moon can be out, no problem. So you need to allocate these filters differently. You can't leave them at, at those um, at, at those frequencies because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see the difference much between the the, the, the sulfur and the hydrogen, for instance. So what we do is we actually allocate, normally allocate your hydrogen to green, O3 we move down right into the middle of the blue spectrum, and sulfur we use on the red, red system, the, the, the red part of the, of the spectrum. Um, and that's called the Hubble, the Hubble palette. So Hubble, that's the way they've done Hubble, so they've used H alpha for green and so on. Obviously that does give you a false image which is nice, your artistic juices can flow again. You can do anything with these, but it's not real. I, I had a look quickly at the internet. Um, 
Okay, let me first go to the first line. So how do you get started? I'd suggest get some textbooks about astrophotography. There's a lot of good information there before you start spending money. There are a lot of uh, astronomy groups on the Yahoo, um, uh, Yahoo groups. <coughs> Join those. Uh, very nice groups there. You learn, I think I learned, uh, most of my stuff I've learned has been through that. Then there's the internet in general, obviously. You can join a club or the association. That are, I know there's an there's a astrophotography club up in Joburg, for instance, that's quite, quite active. The software manuals of the software that you get, use that. There's a lot of good information there. Nice video tutorials. You can, you can buy those, um, very good ones, and they go step by step. For specific software, you can, you can get those. Or, for instance, Photoshop. There are lots of, one, there are lots of um, um, videos out for Photoshop. And importantly, once you decide to buy, select a reputable dealer who can give you the full package. Because you don't want to buy a camera from some guy and a scope from some guy and then it doesn't work. You don't have the proper adapter. So get a guy who can get you the whole package with all the adapters. Make sure that you've got the proper back focus, very important. You see often guys buy something and then they, oops, they're not achieving their back focus. Right, so once you've gone all, done all that, you need to say, okay, what do I have? I've already got a scope. I've already, do I have a camera? And, and then what is your budget? I had a quick look on the internet um, for some typical telescopes. Um, I've tried to stick with Celestron because they're available in South Africa as well. There's a new Celestron. It's a four inch and it comes on a, one of these new mounts and that's a thousand dollars. So that's, that's not, not too bad. They've come down in price um, comparatively speaking. It is a bit slow though, it's 8.82. Um, typically for, for a refractor you'd want to move to a focal length of about uh, a 5. If you want to go deep sky, there's a C9.25 Celestron um, with a very nice, on a very nice, nice mount. It's a, a F10 and that's about 2,000 rand. Uh, dollars, sorry. Two thousand. That, that would have been nice. <laughs> camera. If you've got, if you've got a digital camera, fine. Start with that. I started with that. You see just now, uh, and it's fine for for initial. You can't do really long exposures with it, but you can start off very nicely with it. And yes, a very nice camera compared to what you can buy price-wise. Seventeen hundred dollars for it. So it's a nice small camera. It's cooled. Uh, it seems to give very good, get very good reviews, brand new. Then on the software side, start off with some free software if you can. There's some, as I said, there's some nice free uh, planetarium applications. There's some free capture, capturing uh, software out there as well. If you're serious, I would suggest get, get Maxim DL for $200. You need Photoshop. There are more expensive applications that you can get. That, that Pix Insight, for instance, is a new, a new software written by the Spanish, which is excellent, but costly. Um, many of you probably have Photoshop in some form as well, so go for that. Quickly, what I've been doing, I started off with a $400, that's what they cost now, a little scope like that. My son and myself got interested, but we soon discovered that that is not good enough for started looking at a few clusters, the same ones over and over. Um, then I got a little Mead um, with a little DSi camera. Um, and then I had a, a, a DSi R camera. I'm running out of time, that's why I'm going so quickly. And I replaced that with a one-shot color camera. I sold all that later on, and then I got a refractor with an SDL 1500 camera. That, that was a very nice combination. But three years ago, I got tired of lugging this stuff in and out all the time, and I thought it was time to build a little observatory. So I was busy doing some work anyway, building work, and I just added a top floor onto that with a roll-off roof and a height adjustable pier. And a few years ago, two years ago, I also decided now, to, now I need to go deep sky, and I got a Celestron C40 on an ASA, ASA direct drive mount. 
and now it's fully, almost fully robotic. Um, I can go to bed at night and it's important, especially when you live along the coast, you don't get very good nights. If you've got a good night, you must make use of it. Um, and I'm also adding a dome now for performance in the wind. So there's my setup. Uh, there's the roof closed. There's the pier down. There's the piers up. Roof open. It's, it's, a, it's actually a skylight, a big skylight that opens up. That was for the wind that I put up on the top there. And uh, I've got a new camera now. There's, there's the camera with a mechanical shutter, um, the filter wheel of access guider with the guide camera. There's an ASA mount, uh, cloud sensors, if you can probably just see them up there. Some images quickly. Um, this is the one we did at the um, workshop yesterday. The challenge here is a lot of stars, so you have to keep the star brightness down as far as possible, try and bring out the contrast in the actual image. And SCT doesn't give diffraction spikes, so these are artificial, just added in a bit of artistic license there for the effect. Um, the challenge here was not to blow out um, the center. It actually doesn't look so good on the screen, but um, on a good image you can actually see the little star and the bright star in the middle there. This is a narrowband image where you've got your hydrogen alpha green, additional green on the outside, um, and then the blue, which is the uh, oxygen and the sulfur in the middle. And the last one, that's also a narrowband. But now what we've done here, I've taken the green and sort of made it brownish yellow because green's not a natural, natural looking color really for extra images and bring, brought out the brightness here and here we can see the sulfur and a little bit of oxygen in, in that image. Right, and that's my story. Okay. I might have a spa, yes, yeah, so I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> uh, the, you're probably, probably looking at about uh, 100,000 in that sort of, that sort of order. Fortunately, I've sold a lot of the other stuff, so. And it's over many years. We don't be right to Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks.